Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Just a few days ago, we celebrated Thanksgiving. That's one of my favorite holidays of the year. And of course, we all know that the day after Thanksgiving is referred to as Black Friday. Now, supposedly that name came because it's on that day that retailers at least begin the process of getting out of the red and into the black in their ledger books and actually turning a profit for the year. Recently, I was thinking about that term, Black Friday, and decided that we would have a sermon based upon that topic. I mentioned that to a few people and, and asked if they knew what the sermon was about, and some did. Some thought maybe it was on materialism, or, and certainly that would be a good appropriate topic uh, to deal with. Um, and no, it, it's not uh, referring to... Uh, the Friday before the game for the team up north, fans of that team, you know, they look at that Friday as a Black Friday. No, we're not talking about that, though I had to mention it this morning. What I thought we would do, though, is look and consider a Friday about 2,000 years ago. A Friday that about 2,000 years ago was literally black. I'm aware that there are some who, who wonder if maybe Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday or a different day of the week. Really, that doesn't matter uh, what day of the week he was crucified upon. Um, but we want to think about the events that occurred on, I do believe it was a Friday, about 2,000 years ago. Now, Black Friday, 2,000 years ago, started actually on what we would consider Thursday evening. It was, on the, it was at that time that Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. And we know that as that meal was ending, he instituted what we refer to as the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 26 to 29. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Bobby read it to us. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Of course, we as Christians know that he was instituting the Lord's Supper here, which ultimately is a remembrance of the things that were going to occur to him on this Black Friday. So he starts out this 24-hour period, if you will, with a meal with his loved ones, his disciples, in which he establishes this ongoing ritual that they are to have to remember what it is that he is about to suffer. Later that evening, Jesus spends time in prayer. We read in Luke 22... 41 to 44, he was withdrawn from them, the them being Peter, James, and John, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down, to the ground. And so here we have, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of this Black Friday, and that was we see here the humanity of Jesus. We see that he was a man and he, he feared the things he was going to suffer, just as you or I would fear them, to the point that he prays to the Father, If it be your will, please take this cup away from me. But he concludes saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. 
And then we read that he's, he's being in agony. Well, I would submit physically, he, the agony had not really started. This agony was more of a mental anguish, anxiety over what was going to occur. We read that he began to sweat great drops of blood. And I believe that from what we have learned in the past, that that is a literal statement, that there is a medical condition called hematotridosis, and I don't know if I pronounced that right, but hematotridosis, which a person under extreme stress can indeed, the, the blood vessels in the sweat glands can burst, and they can sweat blood. I believe that took place. So here we see on the night he's betrayed that Jesus is going to the Father. He's already in mental agony, knowing what it is that he's going to endure, and yet he concludes again that he's going to do the Father's will, even though it may not be something that he looks forward to going through himself. Then, of course, comes that betrayal with a kiss from one of his disciples, Judas, Luke 22. As he's there in the garden with his disciples, it says, While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And so then another aspect of his suffering on this day was that not only did he have the mental anguish and the physical anguish and pain that he was about to begin suffering, now he has a betrayal by someone whom he loved, Judas who was supposed to be one of his faithful disciples and followers. Now, Jesus knew who he was. It did not come as a surprise. But I would submit to you that didn't make it any easier when it actually occurred. There may be times when we know that a loved one is going to die very soon. And we know that that is coming, but that doesn't make it any easier when it actually occurs. It still hurts. And so we have one of his faithful... He, Followers, one of the ones that he loved, has betrayed him now uh, with a kiss. And of course, we know not only that, but later on, his disciples flee as well and leave him alone to go through these things that he's about to endure. As Thursday comes to a close, as, as we would consider Thursday, meaning about midnight, we have Jesus saying to these ones who had come to arrest him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But now notice this statement. But this is your hour, the power of darkness, Black Friday. The power of darkness. I would suggest to you that even though all of this was part of God's plan, and this was part of God's scheme of redemption for mankind, Darkness, which we're talking about the devil and his servants, they certainly believed that they were winning a battle here. Maybe even that they were winning the war and putting Jesus to death. And so, you know, we read back in Genesis 3 and 15 that the devil would bruise the heel, excuse me, bruise the heel of the seed of a woman, but that that seed of the woman would then bruise the head of Satan. So he certainly bruised the heel of Jesus, and this was a time of strength when the powers of darkness were in control, at least seemingly, not realizing that actually they were fulfilling God's will. And so he says, this is the, the your hour in the power of darkness. Then we move into Black Friday. Overnight, between what we would call Thursday and Friday, uh, Jesus is first taken to Annas and Caiaphas. Uh, first he's taken to Annas, who is actually the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas. But he is also, in the text, Annas, he is also referred to as the high priest. He, he had a lot of respect, so he's referred to as a high priest in the passages as well. But first he's taken to Annas, John 18, 13. It says, they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, it's, it's while Jesus is before Annas and then later Caiaphas that we have the account of Peter's denials of Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, this is just the example of one of them. 
Peter is, is standing afar off and he's asked if he was one of Jesus' disciples. He says, man, I do not know what you are saying. And we read immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now I would again suggest that this is another aspect of Jesus' suffering here. Um, not so much Peter's denial. I, I believe that later on Jesus works that out with Peter. He knows that, um, you know, when he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? I believe that was an opportunity for Peter to atone. For what he does here. But Jesus we're told. He looked over at Peter. When the rooster crowed. And here's Jesus knowing that. You know he's about to suffer these things. And now one of his disciples. Whom he loves very dearly. Is going out and weeping bitterly. And he can't go comfort him. He can't go offer any consolation at all. And say Peter I know, I know you didn't mean it. Peter it's okay. You made a mistake. I still love you and I know you love me, but no, you know, I can think of few things that would be worse than going to my death and knowing I was about to die and then seeing one of my loved ones suffering um, with me unable to do anything to help them at that time to get through that suffering. It would be very, very difficult. While he is here with Annas and then also later Caiaphas, he is also beaten and mocked. In Luke 22, 63 to 65, it says, Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. And so now that they've resorted to physical... Um, Torture, if you will. They strike him, and they also are mocking him, blindfolding him, and saying, prophesy, tell us who struck you. Imagine that they are doing this to their creator, and they don't even realize it. They don't realize that with one thought, Jesus could incinerate them and end their existence and all our existences. But yet here they are, beating and mocking him, with, at the house of Annas. And then we read that after Annas was done with him, he sent him to his son-in-law Caiaphas, John 18, 24. So he goes first to Annas, then to Caiaphas. Now as morning arrives, what we would call Friday morning, Jesus is standing before Caiaphas and also the Jewish council. And in Luke twenty two sixty six, we read, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council. So it, while he is here at this council, he is again beaten and mocked. Matthew 26, 63 to 68, we read, But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat on his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And so the mocking continues, the beating continues, the shame continues in that they are even spitting upon his face. The one who loves them and the one who is about to die on the cross for their sins, they are treating in this way. And so the decision is made here that he is deserving of death. The Jews, the, the chief priest, the council, they have decided they want Jesus put to death. And as a result, 
he is sent to Pilate. Matthew 27 and 1 says, When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. As a result, they had to take him to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the Roman in charge. The Jews were not allowed to execute prisoners, criminals. It had to have been done by Rome. And so they take him to Pilate. Luke 23, 1 through 5. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. So notice their accusations against Jesus, perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Well, that was just a lie, wasn't it? That was not what Jesus had taught at all. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And they say he's claiming himself to be Christ a king. They're, they're making accusations against Jesus that they hope will incite Pilate against him. Not paying taxes to Caesar. Well, that'll get you in trouble pretty quick. Claiming to be a king. Well, Caesar wouldn't be too happy about someone claiming to be a king. And so they're, they're lying, outright lying. They're distorting the truth and trying to manipulate Pilate into putting Jesus to death. We know, of course, Pilate initially says, I find no fault. And really, he never finds any fault with Jesus. But he eventually gives in. Before, before all that occurs, though, Pilate thinks he has an out. He thinks he has a way out of this responsibility of dealing with Jesus. In Luke 23, 6 and 7, it says, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. He hopes that since Jesus is from Galilee and Herod is in charge of Galilee, that Herod will have to deal with Jesus because evidently Herod was visiting Jerusalem at this time. He was in Jerusalem. And so he sends him to Herod hoping to pass off this responsibility onto Herod so he does not have to make a decision. Luke 23 and 11 just, just a part of what is said about what occurred there. But it says, Herod with his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him. Arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. From the various accounts, it appears that Herod almost looked at Jesus as a magician. He wanted Jesus to come and put on a show for him. And he asked Jesus when he came, you know, perform a sign and... Jesus wouldn't do anything. He wouldn't even answer his questions. And so Pilate quickly got fed up with Jesus. And we read here again, they treated him with content. They mocked him. They put a gorgeous robe on him. They send him back to Pilate. What's also not mentioned here is the crown of thorns that is placed upon his head. And again, you have to look at all the various accounts to get all the information. The crown of thorns they place on his head and also... Them then beating him over the head with a rod, with that crown of thorns still resting upon his head. The torture that is taking place. Well, as we just read, Herod sends him back to Pilate. Pilate then, we read in John 19, 1, takes Jesus and scourges him. I imagine he's, he's hoping that maybe this would placate the crowd, and maybe that once they saw that he had been severely punished, maybe they would be willing to let him go and not be killed. The scourging, as you know, was a terrible thing to endure. Many people died from the scourging itself. A person was uh, strapped uh, with um, 
They're stripped down to the waist. And they are then beaten with a whip that has many different thongs, uh, different uh, strands on which sharp objects are attached. And that individual is then beaten with that whip. It's called a flagellum. And those sharp objects on the end of that whip just destroy the flesh. Many times people died from the scourging by itself, from shock and from blood loss. As after he's scourged, he's mocked and beaten some more, John 19, 2 and 3. Here it says the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put on his purple robe. They said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. So more mocking. The crown of thorns here is mentioned, and a, a purple robe. Now, keep in mind that purple robe being placed on an individual whose back is in the condition that his is in. And imagine that that robe is left on there for a little while. And what would occur in terms of that robe sticking to that congealed blood and the wounds on his back. And then that robe being removed later on. The pain that that would have caused. Matthew 27, beginning at 29, says, When they had twisted a crown of thorns... They put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, and here's where they took the reed. They strike him on the head, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him. And again, that's just a, a quick and easy statement, but just imagine how much that would have hurt for that to take place. They put his own clothes back on him and lead him away to be crucified. Now think of all that he has endured. He's been spat upon and mocked. He's been beaten. He's had this crown of thorns. He's had the scourging that took place. I imagine if you were to lay eyes on Jesus at this point, it would look like a nightmare. Probably covered in blood from head to toe. Literally. And he hasn't even gotten to the cross yet. And yet we often focus on the cross, and rightly so, it, it, it is horrible too. But he's already suffered more than you or I most likely will ever suffer. He's then marched through the streets. They sort of made like a parade out of it. He's marched through the streets like a common criminal. He's forced to bear his own cross, probably just the cross member, not the, the whole cross. Um, and it's estimated that that cross would have weighed maybe 125 pounds. They have, they have archaeologically found crosses, and they know about the size and proximate weight. And we know, of course, that he was so weak that he was unable, and they had to have someone help him carry his cross. There would be soldiers carrying a sign called a Titleist that would list his crime. Jesus' title is said, Jesus, King of the Jews. And that title is, that sign was then when they were put on the cross, that is the sign that is placed above the cross, a list of their crime. And his was Jesus, King of the Jews. I think a way a pilot sort of thumbing his nose at the Jews, they wanted him to change it, you know. To, he said he was the King of the Jews, and Pilate, he didn't do, he didn't change it. He said, what is written is written. Um, so he really had committed no crime deserving of death. So he's put on the cross. John 19, verses 18 and 19, it says, Where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. And then Pilate wrote the title, put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Again, the if a normal human being were writing a book about the crucifixion of Jesus, they would probably do very much like I'm doing right now and going into detail. We like details sometimes. I don't necessarily like to think about these details. But the Bible just says that he was crucified. He was put on the cross and does not go into a lot of detail about what occurred. I think when we think about some of the details, though, that will help us to appreciate 
what it is that Jesus actually went through on this Black Friday. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion. It actually started probably with the Persians who came well before that. But the Romans, by their time, had perfected it as a form of torture. Once they got to Golgotha, the place of crucifixion, he would have been forced to lay down on the ground. His hands would have been nailed to the crossbeam. The nails, and again we know this from archaeology, the nails are about five to seven inches long, about three-eighths of an inch thick, and they're, they have a square shaft. They were actually placed through the wrist. I've, I've had folks argue about that and say, well, the scriptures say hand. Well, in these times, the wrist was considered part of the hand. Um, and we're told that a nail through the hand would not support the weight of a person. But a nail through the wrist would. So they put the nails through the wrist. These nails go through a nerve cluster which makes it all the more painful. And that would have sent bolts of pain through up through the arm, both arms, as they were being put in. And then any movement after the nails were in there would have caused great pain. Now the arms of the condemned person were left slightly bent. They weren't out straight. And now you might think that was a form of mercy, but actually no. If his arms were kept straight, it would have caused him to die quicker. Allowing a little bit of slack in the arms so that there is some movement possible actually made it possible for them to survive longer and suffer longer on the cross. And we'll explain why in a moment. Once the hands were attached, the cross member was put on to the vertical portion of the cross and then it, then it would have been stood up. The, the feet were nailed, or sometimes they were tied. We know Jesus' feet were nailed. They were nailed to the vertical portion of the cross. Again, uh, the nail, we're told, passes through a nerve cluster, and any movement, putting any type of weight on your feet, would have caused excruciating pain. Once the person is attached to the cross, the titleist was placed over the head and the cross is then raised, put into a hole in the ground. Those who were crucified usually died in one of two ways. One was what they call exhaustion asphyxia or they suffocate. With all of one's weight being supported by the arms and shoulders, it makes it difficult to breathe, specifically to exhale. In order to exhale properly, you had to lift with your feet to take the pressure off of your shoulders and chest. Remember when I said they left the arms bent a little bit? This allowed that to take place. It allowed them to be able to, to lower and raise. And in doing that, Every time they do, those nails are, are moving in that wound. You've got the back that is torn up, scraping up and down on that rough wood of the cross behind him. But he has to do it. The one being crucified has to do that in order to breathe. Nobody wants to suffocate. And so this excruciating pain would have been going up his arms and up his legs as he's trying to breathe. Eventually, they get just too weak. Their lungs begin to actually fill with fluid, and they die. They suffocate. If they don't die quickly enough, what the Romans would do is come by with a, a club or a hammer of some sort and break their legs. And you remember, they, they, they came to do that. With Jesus and the two thieves, they did it to the thieves, but Jesus, when they came, had already died. Which again was a fulfillment of prophecy, because none of his bones would be broken, was one of the prophecies in regard to Jesus. But that's why they would come to break the legs, so that they could not lift themselves anymore and breathe, and they would then die very quickly. So, that was one of the ways that people died, and I, I personally don't think that's the way that Jesus died. The second way, they say, is just from heart failure. Heart failure. With all the stress placed on the body, all the trauma 
sometimes the heart just gives out. Sometimes they say blood clots would develop that would pass into the heart. And they would eventually, it would be like a heart attack almost. A person would die from that. And this death would have been much quicker. More of a mercy, if you will, than the continuing lingering and suffocating. And there are many who think that that's probably what happened to Jesus. He died before the other two um, rather suddenly. They actually were surprised that he was already dead. That's why they put the spear in his side just to make sure. Before he dies, though, at about noon on that Friday, it becomes truly black. We had a red forest, Luke 23, 44 through 48. It was about the sixth hour, that would have been noon. And there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus had When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And then we have the reaction of the centurion. I would suggest they're probably the same reaction on many people. But the centurion is mentioned, and as he sees these things that takes place, he says, surely this is a righteous man. And notice the whole crowd came together. Seeing what had been done, they beat their breasts and return. A Black Friday. 2,000 years ago, the Friday on which our Lord was crucified for the sins of mankind. On that day, your debt to God was paid. We sang the song, He Paid a Debt. I asked Brent to lead that because it fits very well. We said that... (coughs) what we refer to as Black Friday. It's when retailers, uh, they look forward to it because it's a time when they can sort of get out of debt for the year and actually begin to make a profit. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid our debt off and got us, if you will, out of the red and into or made it possible for us to at least be in God's good graces. Romans 6 and 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. That, that's the debt that we incur to God when we sin. We, we incur the, the debt of death. Spiritual death. Separation from God. But notice the second half of that verse says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now think about this. On that Black Friday... God bought you a gift. He made salvation possible through the death of his son. The currency that he used was the blood of his only son. Hebrews 9 and 28. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He shall appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. It was the blood of Jesus that paid off our debt. It was the blood of Jesus that God used to buy us the gift of salvation. We're going to conclude by reading 1 Peter 2, 23 and 24. This again in regard to Jesus. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus had to endure that Black Friday because of Ralph. You could insert your name there as well. It was the fault of each and every one of us that he had to die on the cross. And it's by his stripes, his suffering, his blood, that our salvation is made possible. Brethren, when we think about all that Jesus did to make our salvation possible, it seems logical to me that we would want to give our lives over in service to him. 
If somebody died for one of your loved ones to save their life, wouldn't you feel indebted to that individual? And yet here we have Jesus who 2,000 years ago died for everyone to make our salvation possible for our souls. Whatever he asks of me, I am obligated to do if I'm grateful, if I love him, and if I'm thankful for what he has done to me. Being a worship service, that's not an issue if we love Jesus. Partaking in the work of the church which he purchased with his blood, that's not an issue if we love Jesus because he died for our sins and I want to show my love and appreciation for what he has done for me. And friend, if you have not yet become a Christian, we offer you the opportunity right now to become a servant of that one who paid your debt off 2,000 years ago. Friend, he made your salvation possible, but you have to accept the gift, and you accept that gift by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe that he is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, won't you then turn from your sins, confess your faith in him as he has commanded us to do, and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Friend, if you've not done that, we offer you the opportunity to do that now, and I hope that you'll make the decision to do that. Maybe you're a Christian who's become unfaithful. Maybe you're a Christian who's forgotten about all that Jesus went through for you on the cross and you've not been showing your love and thankfulness to him by your actions. Maybe you've allowed sin to come into your life and you need to repent. If you need to be restored to a right relationship with God, you need to ask God's forgiveness and repent of the sin in your life and he'll give you forgiveness. And we would be glad to help. As we conclude the lesson, if there are any here today who, who are not satisfied with your relationship with God, whether you want to become a Christian or be restored as a Christian, we would be glad to help. We encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.